We continue our discussion on metalloproteins. In the previous lecture, we looked at metalloproteins, understood their coordination, and which metals were involved in specific biochemical processes in the body. In the course of the lecture, we looked at the role of magnesium, manganese, copper, and zinc in some specific examples. In this lecture, we will be looking at iron sulfur proteins. It will be focused on iron. This will include catalase, peroxidase, nitrogenase, and also ferritin. Metalloproteins in general, as we saw in the previous lecture, are proteins that are bound by at least one metal ion. And we looked at the abundance of the different types of metal ions that are, are present in proteins. The coordination occurs through the nitrogen, as we saw mostly from the imidazole of histidine residues, the sulfur from the sulfur-containing amino acids, cysteine or methionine, and oxygen that could be part of the carbonyl oxygen atoms, could be from the carboxylic acid side chains, or also water. In metalloenzymes in general, one of the coordination sites is labile, making one of the bonds that could be easily broken or displaced for a specific enzymatic reaction to occur. Iron. We will be looking at iron in a bit more detail. This is what is called a D-block transition metal, and it has a large number of possible oxidation states. In the body, it exists as the ferrous, that is the Fe2+, the ferric Fe3+, or ferril Fe4+. And the Fe3-Fe2 combination is the most common. Iron can bind to a large number of ligands and proteins and as a result participates in many biochemical pathways. For example, we have seen iron in some of the enzymatic reactions that we looked at. We will be also considering hemoglobin myoglobin where we have iron as a transport protein where we would have the binding and the transport of oxygen and it is also involved in the regulation of self, cell differentiation and growth. The iron containing compounds that we see in the body are the iron sulfur cluster, a very interesting type of iron containing compound present in a number of proteins. The heme that is present as we know in hemoglobin and myoglobin and an oxo diiron example that is shown here where we have the coordination with the oxo and in this case, we have the iron sulfur. In this case, we have the heme. And in this case, we have an oxo diiron example. Systems that are present in proteins. The iron sulfur proteins occurs extensively in living organisms. This participates in electron transfer processes. We have an example called the rubridoxins. These rubridoxins have one iron center and ferridoxins have multiple iron centers. The iron is bound to sulfur either in the form of an inorganic sulfide or in cysteine, the sulfur from cysteine. And the coordination number in this case is four and all of them have more or less tetrahedral geometry in their structural aspect. If we look at the rubridoxins, this is an example of a rubridoxin protein. It is a small iron containing protein and it is present in sulfur metabolizing bacteria. The simple iron sulfur protein has a single iron per molecule of the protein. It takes part in one electron transfer. This is the active site where the iron sulfur is ob obtained, where we have the sulfurs that are, that are coordinated 
from the cysteine residues present in the protein that coordinate the iron. So the single iron tetrathiolate protein, the thiolate indicates that this is from the sulfur atom that we see in the cysteine. Unlike other iron sulfur proteins, rubridoxin does not have an inorganic sulfur. We will see examples where inorganic sulfur atoms are present. It is coordinated by the four sulfur from cysteine residues and it exists as Fe2 and Fe3+, plus, being involved in a specific process showing a negative redox potential. Ferritoxins that are multiple iron centers have an indication of the presence of an iron sulfur cluster. In this case, the representation is, for example, in this manner, where we have 2Fe2S or written as Fe2S2 protein, indicating the type of the cluster that is present or the iron sulfur cage, as it is sometimes sometimes called, present in the protein. This is called the plant type feridoxin, present in the spinach plant and also found in mammals and bacteria. If we look at the specific structural aspects of this protein now, we will see that we have the iron. These are the two iron atoms that are present. These are coordinated with the sulfur from the two cysteine moieties, cysteine amino acids present in the polypeptide chain of the protein in each case, but also we have a coordination with an inorganic sulfur. So this is where we see the specific two sulfide bridges. The core structure is represented as Fe2 mu 2 S2. The oxidized Fe3 plus Fe3 plus form is reduced to an Fe2 plus Fe3 plus form from a one electron transfer. And the EMF is about 0.15 volts to minus 0.45 volts. The feridoxin structures can also have a Fe3 S4 type of structures. The representation would be 3Fe4S in its nomenclature, where again we see the iron sulfur cage that could have the sulfur from the cysteine residue or the inorganic sulfurs that are associated here in this specific type of 3Fe4S protein. Here, Fe3 plus in its oxidized form is seen and we have 2 Fe3 plus and 1 Fe2 plus in the reduced form. So there are three atoms of iron that we see here. Fe3 plus originally in its oxidized form, all of them. And in the reduced form, we have 2 Fe3 plus and 1 Fe2 plus. This is present in the enzyme aconitase. This enzyme is involved in the catalysis of the conversion of citrate to isocitrate. Further, if we look at more feridoxins, in this case again, as we saw, the rubridoxins are the one that have a single iron center. In this case, we have multiple iron centers. We saw an example of two, an example of three. This is where we have four iron centers. So this is a 4-Fe-4-S protein. It is a high potential iron sulfur protein forming a distorted cubic structure because of the coordination. And considering that the polypeptide chain is involved in the coordination, this is present in a protein called nitrogenase and hydrogenase. The risky protein is another protein that has the iron sulfur cage as notified here, where we have in this case the combination of two histidines connected, coordinated to an iron. And this case, we have the sulfur and 
2 inorganic sulfur. And these are components of cytochrome BC1 complexes and cytochrome B6F complexes, very important aspects of electron transfer. In the protein heme erythrin, we have the structure as an oligomeric protein that participates in oxygen transport. It is a non-heme iron containing protein and it is also found in a few marine invertebrates. This structure occurs mostly as an octamer and some tetrameric, trimeric and also dimeric forms are also available. Here we see the monomers that have a four helix bundle to them as indicated by the four helices that are observed here. The four helices that form the four helix bundle. Each monomer has a diiron site. In this case, we have the diiron site, the coordination is through the histidine. So we have now a glutamic acid come into the picture where we have the specific coordination with the aspartic acid, glutamic acid and the histidine moieties in heme erythrin, but there is no heme as seen in the other cases where we have the deoxy form in this manner and once we have the oxygen bound form, the site available on the iron is where oxygen binds. So we have the formation of a specific coordination for iron and the site present, a coordination site present on iron will have bound oxygen to it. The oxyform has a diferic oxo bridge as it is called. So this is an example of heme erythrin. For catalase and peroxidase, these are specific proteins that are heme binding proteins. The heme B containing enzyme that catalyzes the reactions with hydrogen peroxide. Peroxidase catalyzes the oxidation of a large variety of organic and inorganic substrates by H2O2. And this is an example of the reaction of peroxidase. Catalase, on the other hand, catalyzes the disproportionation of H2O2 in a specific type of reaction where we see the disproportionation to H2 and O2, an oxidation and a reduction. In the function of the catalase and the peroxidase enzymes is to prevent any potential dangerous oxidant buildup. And these are specific examples of such type of enzymes, the cytochrome C peroxidase, horseradish peroxidase and human erythrocyte catalase. The this is the structure of the human erythrocyte catalase and this is the structure of the cytochrome C peroxidase where we can see the specific bound iron atoms here. In the heme bound form in this particular protein where we have the Fe3 bound in this form, there is a specific coordination with the two oxygen atoms here. Then we have the active site cavity contains histidine and in some cases even aspartic acid or arginine. The side chains are ideally situated in a manner that would interact with the hydrogen peroxide that was bound. So here we have the oxygen of the hydrogen peroxide bound to Fe. This facilitates the cleavage of this specific bond. The arginine residues involved here are arginine 72, 112 and 365. They form a specific salt bridge with the carboxylate group of heme in this case and this helps to keep the heme group in position in addition to increasing the redox potential and one arginine is also involved 
in the binding of the cofactor NADPH. So the reaction is such that we have the formation of water and we now look at nitrogenase. In nitrogenase, this is a protein involved in the conversion of the nitrogen to a usable form such as ammonia. Nitrogen is essential for the amino acid synthesis and nucleic acid synthesis. The atmospheric nitrogen in this case is inert and it cannot be used directly. So, it has to be converted to a usable form such as ammonia to form or to be utilized for the production of amino acid. Now, when we look at this from an industrial point of view, it requires extremely high pressure and high temperature conditions for the conversion to occur. However, nitrogenase can perform this at normal conditions. The protein itself catalyzes therefore the reduction of dinitrogen to ammonia and it plays a very important role in nitrogen fixation. These enzymes are produced by certain bacteria like Azotobacter and they occur in three forms, the molybdenum form, the vanadium form and the iron form. Molybdenum nitrogenase is found in legume-associated rhizobia and is the most extensively studied and characterized. So this is a complex enzyme that contains basically two types of proteins. One is the Fe protein and the other is the FEMO protein. In the Fe protein, it is a homodimer. That means it is a dimer of identical subunits which contains one Fe4S4 cluster. We looked at the Fe, we looked at the FeS clusters previously in the lecture. So here we have an Fe4S4 cluster. We see the coordination where we have the four sulfur atoms here, the sulfide atoms here, the four iron atoms in these positions that form the cube. So the cluster is formed by the 4-Fe and the 4-S. That is what forms the cube. This lies in an interface between the two identical subunits. We saw that this forms a homodimer. So this is in the inter interface between the two identical subunits. And the redox potential depends upon the presence or the absence of ATP. So when we look at the Fe protein, its function is to transfer electrons from a reducing agent such as feridoxin or flavadoxin to the FeMO type protein. This electron transfer requires an input of chemical energy that comes from the attachment and hydrolysis of ATP. The ATP hydrolysis results in a change in the conformation and following this change in conformation, this facilitates the electron transfer by bringing the Fe protein and the FeMO protein closer to each other. So this is the FeMO protein details. It is a heterotetramer that contains two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. This contains two iron sulfur clusters that are called P clusters that again lie between the interface of the alpha and the beta subunits. And the two FeMO cofactors are present within these alpha subunits. When we look at the P cluster, it is a cluster of Fe8S7. When we consider this cluster, therefore, so we have the alpha and the beta. And in the P cluster, we can look at the coordination of the overall setup or how this nomenclature exists. If we count the number of irons, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is an Fe8. Following this, we look at the number of sulfur atoms that are not associated with the polypeptide chain. 
So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So this is S7. If we look at the other sulfurs, we will see that they are associated with the cysteine residues that are part of the polypeptide chain. This lies at the interface of the alpha and the beta supplements. So this P cluster, the Fe8S7 cluster that we saw, we have it. So this is where we have the alpha subunit. This is where we have the beta subunit. And this is at the interface of the clusters. The core Fe8-7 of the P cluster has a form of two Fe4-S3 cubes that are linked by this central sulfur atom. Each P cluster is covalently linked to the MOFE protein by six cysteine residues, as we can see in the specific structure of the cluster that is shown. When we look at the FEMO cofactor, there is the specific coordination associated with this binding site. And the coordination or the accommodation of the nitrogen is extremely important in the nitrogen fixation study or the biological nitrogen fixation associated with the nitrogenase, nitrogenase enzyme. This has the capability of catalytically cleaving the strong triple bond of nitrogen to result in the formation of ammonia. If we look at the M cluster that is associated with the FEMO cofactor, in this case, we are looking at the nitrogen binding site present here, and we see the association of the molybdenum that is coordinated not only to a histidine, but to specific side chains and carbonyl atoms associated with the polypeptide chain. So each FEMO contains two non-identical clusters that have Fe4S3 and MOFE3S3, one of the iron atoms being replaced by the molybdenum. They are linked by three sulfide ions and each FEMO cofactor is then covalently linked to the alpha subunit of the protein by one cysteine residue and one histidine residue. So we have the specific orientation of these methodologies, the compounds, the M cluster, the P cluster, the Fe4, S4, and the alpha and the beta subunits where we will see the Fe protein and the FeMO protein and specific iron sulfur cages associated with the proteins. So the electrons from the Fe protein go to the MOFE protein at the P clusters and this is followed by electron transfer and we have these cofactors acting as sites for the nitrogen fixation. The nitrogen binding, as we saw, happens in the central cavity of the cofactor. Further to this, where we are looking at the Fe protein, a cartoon representation here, where we have the Fe protein and the FeMO protein, and we have the whole nitrogenase protein complex and in Important complex involved in nitrogen fixation. Our next example, so this is where we have our nitrogen fixation, N2O2-2NH3, in this extremely important protein complex. Another very important iron-containing protein associated with iron storage and transport is transferrin. Transferrin and ferritin, as we will see in a couple of slides later, transferrin mediates the transport of iron through the blood plasma. It acts as an antimicrobial agent as well to scavenging the iron that is present. It binds iron tightly but reversibly so that it can be utilized when required. 
and it is generally found in biological fluids. The transferrin here contains two domains, similar domains, the N lobe and the C lobe. And these again are comprised of two subdomains that binds an Fe3 and a carbonate ion. The domain show a hinge-like bending type of capability to clamp down on the iron carbon unit. So this is how it cl clamps down on the iron carbon unit where we have the apo form of transferrin and we have the holo form of transferrin. So this is the transferrin exam example where we have the N lobe and we have the C lobe and the specific transferrin receptor where it is going to bind to the iron for the specific transport. The transport therefore occurs in this fashion where we have the coordination, we have the carbonate ion here and the coordination of the iron occurs through the tyrosine and the histidine moieties present here. The apoTF now with the iron that is going to form the holoTF has a specific transferrin receptor. This transferrin receptor then forms inside the cell. So on the, on the transferrin receptor that is present on the cell, this is the outside of the cell and here is the inside of the cell and we have the cell membrane. What is formed in this case is a specific coated vesicle that has the iron bound to it inside. So this is where we have the iron bound. The red dots indicate the iron bound. It is a coated vesicle that is cleaved off here, forming a coated vesicle inside the cell. Once this is uncoated, it forms what is called an endosome that with the help of an ATP proton pump then releases the iron. Once this iron is released, it is taken up by ferritin, which is the storage protein. And we again have our apoTF ready to bind iron again. So inside the cell, the vesicles form endosomes when they are uncoated. The membrane of the endosomes has a specific ATP-driven proton pump. And due to the uncoating, the inside of the endosome pH is lowered about to about 5 or 6 and this facilitates the release of iron due to the protonation of the carbonate and the tyrosinate O-. The released Fe is now available for storage in ferritin. So what is ferritin? Ferritins are metalloproteins that can contain unusually large amounts of metal that is the iron and release it in a very controlled fashion. The storage of iron in an inert but accessible form and it is produced by almost all living organisms. This is a hollow globular protein, a 24 MER protein. That means it has 24 subunits with a molecular weight of 474 kilodaltons. Inside the ferritin shell, iron ions form crystallites together with the phosphate and hydroxide ions where it is stored in an oxyhydroxide form. Apoferritin, on the other hand, is ferritin without the iron. This is generally present in the mucosa membrane of the intestine and the liver. It performs a very important biological function in the binding and the storing of the iron. And this is achieved by combining with ferric oxide ferric hydroxide phosphate compound to form our ferritin. So this is the ferritin. This is the structure of the 24 mer ferritin that we see. The ferritin test is used nowadays to determine the total iron storage capacity. So apart from hemoglobin tests that are now done to determine the amount of hemoglobin in the body, that being an iron transport protein as well, this is an iron storage capacity protein. So the diagnosis for this is tested 
for iron deficiency or iron overload. The normal range for ferritin in blood serum is given here for females and males. And if we have a high level, this could lead to liver disease and rheumatoid arthritis, among others. And low levels could lead to iron deficiency anemia. The typical test is called a two-site immunoradiometric assay. We will not go into the details of this. This is beyond the course. But just to give you some idea that the blood serum is mixed with a specific antibody that is an anti-human ferritin. And these are conjugated on plastic beads that act as a solid face. The ferritin that is present in the serum will bind with this. The insoluble anti-human ferritin complex is then treated with a radio-labeled anti-human ferritin and the solid phase is washed off and then this is checked with a gamma counter to check the amount of ferritin concentration using a calibration curve that can be indicative of whether there is iron deficiency or iron overload in the body. So our discussion on metalloproteins has touched upon the importance of metal ions in biochemical pathways. We have looked at specific metal ions in this aspect and specific aspects of metal coordination and electron transfer. These are the references. Thank you.